All right, we are going to do some Sunday school today. Hopefully, I'm going to get this up by the end of the day so that it don't turn into Monday school. So, we're going to be in the adult quarterly. I know uh, <clears throat> I know the new ones got passed out this morning, but we're not ready to move on to them just yet. We're still in the Behold, He Cometh, Revelation 1 through 9 uh spring quarter spring quarter ain't over we still got a few more weeks we're in number chapter 12 I wrote it on the board back here if you can see it the opening of the seals begins and our text is going to be revelation 6 verses 1 through let me get this 1 through 17 let me get my microphone situated here because i don't want to talk directly into it anyway let's start reading and a first look. The events that begin here are the culmination of the work of God. At this time, the age of grace, what the Bible refers to as the last days, is closing and the time of judgment is at hand. These events take place during the last seven years of God's dealing with his people as foretold in Daniel chapter 9 with the coming of the Messiah 483 of the years determined on Israel have come to pass, and seven of them are yet to happen. The things that are recorded in Revelation 6 through 19 deal with this seven year period of time. So, if we go Daniel 9 24, actually, I just finished up my class on the book of Daniel at the Bible Institute. Daniel 9. Now, you gotta read the whole chapter to really. You'll get a feel for it, but I just want to give you a little snapshot. Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So there's 70 weeks we refer to as Daniel's 70 weeks. They're not literal weeks like we look at them now. Like we have seven days and we call that a week. But in on God's calendar here of prophecy, a week is seven years. So the 70th week, 69 of the weeks have already happened. And you're like, well, that means the next one's coming up. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> and the 70th week is the tribulation, the seven years of the tribulation. Now, the reason that 69 of the years have already happened and the 70th haven't happened yet is because of the current dispensation we're in now, the church age dispensation. When the Jews, when the Messiah came, the Jews rejected the Messiah, so God postponed the kingdom and the church age. That's what we're in now. It's like, they, uh, if you read in the book of Acts, you'll see how the Jews rejected their Messiah, therefore the kingdom didn't come. So the church age came, and that's what we're living in now. And then once the church age is over, then that last week, uh, the tribulation will come around. Now, the timeline of Revelation, to help you better understand it a little bit, and I'm probably butchering it a little bit here. Revelation chapter 1 through 4 is the church. It's talking about the church. We read that already a couple of weeks ago. Uh where we tried to the best of my ability to go through the letters to the churches and God was speaking to the church and then the church was raptured and chapter number four would be where the church is raptured and you don't hear nothing else about the church until the second coming. And then in book chapter five, which is it we're in now, the book uh, or what we were in last week, the sealed book is open. And then chapter 6 through 19 deals with the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And then chapters 20 through 22 deal with uh, Jesus' return and the establishment of his millennial kingdom. The Bible often gives us much information about a short period of time. For instance, in the books that record the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, nearly one-third of those scriptures deal with with the last seven days of his life on earth. God shines the light of prophecy where it is needed 
the most. So I noticed today people people are overly concerned. Come on now. People are overly concerned with what's happening today. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that you shouldn't be. I'm just saying perhaps there's other things to think about. Uh one thing I've noticed, I mentioned it on the podcast, is that this whole pandemic thing that we're going through now has brought out some of the craziest conspiracy theories. I'm telling you, I got, I've seen, I've seen the ones where, well, they're going to have the vaccine and it's going to be, you know, you don't have to, for, they're going to force it on you and it's going to be the mark of the beast and this and that. And then I've seen, uh, things oh this is the the new world order is being ushered in just you know wake up you know that's everybody's favorite thing to say when are y'all gonna wake up the new world order is coming in and uh when i read that stuff you know what i say i don't care i don't care people talk about oh this is the mark of the beast i don't care well this this is the new world order i don't care all that stuff that you're talking about the mark of the beast and the new world order and stuff like that. All that happens after the church is raptured out of here. After the church is gone. And me being part of the church means I'm not going to be here when any of that stuff happens. So if this, the vaccine is going to be the mark of the beast, well good. That means I'm about to get out of here. I don't really care what happens after that. Well, the new world order. Well, that means I'm about to get out of here. So I ain't too concerned about whether or not your conspiracy theory is true, because I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be gone. The Bible tells us a lot about the tribulation because the majority of the world is going to be in it. You know, if you look at, just look at the statistics that tell you, like I've mentioned before, what percentage of the world's population is Christian, and it'll say, oh, this percent. Now cut that in half, and you might have a more accurate number. Uh, That's still a minority when, once you do the math correctly, that's still a minority of people who are going to be taken in the rapture. So the majority of the people on earth are going to be around uh, when the tribulation takes place. Now, we should learn these things. It's a good idea to learn them and know them, but it ain't for the church. The tribulation period of time is called the time of Jacob's trouble. That means it's Jew. It's for the Jews. It's Pretty, pretty obvious by the name there. It's for the Jews. It's not for the church. As we study through Revelation, we will learn that there are four series of seven events mentioned in this book. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, seven thunders, and seven vials. We have no information about the seven thunders, so obviously our knowledge of end time events is incomplete. Each of the series of seven that are revealed to us follow a discernible pattern. The first four events in each series are outward, visible, and relatively easy to recognize. The last three events are more behind the scenes, speaking about the spiritual powers that influence our physical world. As we study, remember that in the beginning of the book, we are taught that these words are a blessing to those who read them, hear them, and keep them. So seven, now what's the number seven in the Bible if you've ever uh, had any kind of learning on Bible numerology, which is not really my thing, but, you know, I I do know a little bit about it. Seven is the number of completion. Uh, God created everything in six days, and then what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. He It was complete. It was done. Now God will destroy and renew the world in seven days. As I mentioned, every year of the tribulation represents one day. And Daniel's 70th week. So God created in seven days. He's going to destroy in seven days. We're going to read Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. First few verses. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard as it were the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. The lamb who was worshipped in heaven was found worthy to open the seals of the book, 
When he opened the first one, the four beasts John saw specifically invited him to come and observe what happened when the seal was opened. John described what he saw as accurately as he could. But we must remember that he used figures and metaphors that were familiar to him to describe what happened in heaven so that we could understand it on earth. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4, we read about Paul's similar experience and we learn there that some things that happen in heaven are not lawful to utter on earth. Then let me open my Bible software. I should have had that done. But if you want some good Bible software for your computer, I recommend eSword. It's free to download and it comes with the KJV. Like you can get any Bible you want, but when you when you download it, it automatically comes with the KJV. And it's free, but you got to pay for like add-ons and stuff like that. But this, the free version that you get when you download has got you know plenty of stuff on it. But uh, we're going to go read 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 4. It says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell God knoweth, such an one caught up in the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell God knoweth, how that he was caught up in the paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So, in this passage, Paul writes as if he's speaking about somebody else. Now, it's pretty wild, wild. It's pretty widely held belief that Paul is speaking about himself here. He just doesn't want to use himself in the first person there. But we all know he's talking about himself. And I've heard some scholars talk about whenever Paul was stoned and they drug him out of the city and left him for dead. Some people say that must have been the time when he went up to the third heaven for anyway but that's what i've heard i don't know he says he heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter now john's usage of metaphors is what usually puts people off from reading the book of revelation the preacher that runs uh, the bible college that i go to he has a good way uh Good saying, he said uh, one time was, take the Bible, because, you know, as independent Baptists that are dispensational and King James only, we take, we're known for taking the Bible literal. And people, you know, might make fun of us for that and whatnot, but I don't see anything wrong with taking the Bible literally. And his thing he said was, take the Bible as literally as you can, unless it's impossible to do so. So, like, when it, what we just read here about the beast, where the beast told John to open to, it says the four beasts saw John saw specifically invited him to come and observe what happened when the seal was open. If it says four beasts, then that's what I'm going to assume it was four animals, four animals. I'm going to take it literally. So, and like there's passages where it talks about locust and revelation so at some point we'll probably get to it and there's all these preachers that talk about oh well they're talking about attack helicopters no that's not i won't take the bible literally <laughs> if it says a swarm of locusts then it was a swarm of locusts i'm just gonna take it literally john first saw a rider on a white horse this immediately brings to mind the white horse mentioned in revelation 19 in that passage, the writer is clearly identified. Wait, the writer is identified clearly as Jesus, but there are important differences in these passages. The context is entirely different. Context is so important. One is at the beginning, the other at the end. However, the similarities give us some important clues about the identity of this writer. Note that he has a bow, but no arrows. He comes to conquer and he wears a crown. This appears to be the Antichrist, the man of sin mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2. How can he conquer without arrows? Simply put, he is a deceiver and he uses deception to cause men to be conquered by a lie. In his message about the end of the age in Matthew 24, Jesus repeatedly warned us not to be deceived. Satan is a liar and he is good at what he does. 
2 Thessalonians 2, 9-12 clearly identifies the work of the man of sin. He is a deceiver and he conquers by deception. The Antichrist, he is a slick talker. That's what he is. 2 Thessalonians, my computer is going awire. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-12 even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness." So the Antichrist, he'll conquer people without having to use violence at all. He won't have to shoot nobody, don't have to stab nobody, no kind of no kind of thing like that. Now Jesus warned of the Antichrist's deceit in Matthew twenty four five, where he said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Oh, I wrote that down. I could have just read it. Anyway, Revelation 6, verses 3 through 4, where we're at now. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The second seal was open, and the second horse went out. This horse is red, and his rider is identified by his actions. This is war. At first, a war between the great armies of the nations of earth, who fight for a cause, whether real or imagined. In recent history, we have seen the two world wars, where almost every nation on earth was at war, on one side or the other. This kind of war is unprecedented in human history. Even now, there are wars raging on earth. So the second rider is war. And sometimes in America, we get the idea that when we're not at war, and we have been at war for like the last 15 years or something, I don't know. Uh, but we get the idea when there's when we're not at war, then the world is at peace. The world is at peace, but that is not the case. Uh, there's always wars going on, even if we don't know about them. You know, you don't hear about half the wars that are going on in this world because, you know, the news might not think is that important. You know, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. <clears throat> now, in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, there ain't going to be no war because, like I said, the Antichrist is a deceiver. He's a slick talker. He's going to conquer so many people with his words, and there's not going to be any war. So the first three and a half years of the tribulation is going to seem pretty great, but it but it's not. That's not going to be the case. But the fact that there's no war in the first half of the tribulation is why what makes this this significant. About you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Because that'll be a thing they thought was behind them. But like I said, this, this time of peace is going to be short-lived. However, there's a second kind of war mentioned here. This is the war where men, not nations, kill one another. A new kind of threat and a new kind of war has arisen in this country century. This is a war without national declaration. We call it by various names. It's called terrorism, guerrilla warfare, or civil unrest. But the effect is the same. Men kill each other to accomplish personal and often vague goals that have little to do with national policies or ambitions. The warfare that we are in today is not for control of territory. It is a purely ideological struggle. Then finally, this writer is given a great sword. Here is a terrible weapon that can destroy on an unprecedented scale. Sadly, such weapons exist today, and there are men on Earth who are willing to use them. Nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons are indeed a great sword that can kill millions. Their very presence changes the political dynamics of the Earth. 
When this happens, peace will not return until Jesus brings it at the end of this time of trouble. So you probably, I know I have, often wondered why do these nations like China and North Korea, why do they get to do the things they do and get away with it? Seemingly no punishment. You know, you might slap some sanctions on them, but that don't really hurt nothing. Uh, they simply seem to get away with whatever they want to get away with. And the fact of the matter is they have nuclear weapons. They have nuclear weapons. And it's easy to fight someone when you think you got the upper hand. You know, when you're like, oh, yeah. Like when we went into Iraq and whatnot, we were pretty confident we're going we're gonna to squash them. We're going to squash them. Whenever you go into a battle, where, like in the 90s when we went into Kuwait, and stuff, places like that. We're like, we're obviously the more powerful army, so we had the advantage. But, you know, like if you were going to fight somebody and he was smaller than you, you'd be like, hey, I'm about to whoop this guy. But if both of y'all had a gun or a baseball bat or something, you'd be like, oh, maybe I'll just leave him alone, you know? You think, you think twice about it when you're equally matched, you know what I'm saying? So that's the thing here with them. Once the Great Tribulation begins, there will be no peace, only chaos, and not just as far as political turmoil, but uh, domestic turmoil as well, as we'll read about a little bit later. Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The third seal revealed a black horse and its rider. This is very interesting and it aptly pictures life today. This rider has a pair, has a, this rider has a scale or a pair of balances in his hand. The scale is a symbol of commerce. It is used to measure things that are sold and assigns a value for them. This indicates chaos in an economic system that is totally out of control. The opening of this seal will mean complete financial chaos on the earth. This has happened regionally from time to time, but when this seal opens, it will be worldwide. Two things characterize this economic collapse. First, there is a perverted relationship of labor to reward. A man will work all day, long enough for just enough food to feed himself. A penny represented a day's wage, and the measure of wheat or three measures of barley represented the food needed for daily consumption. Now we move from the chaos of war to financial chaos. Another thing people get all upset about is the number 666. 600, score, six. Uh, I've seen people talk about how they're at the, red, the cash register and the total will ring up $6.66 and they'll grab like a pack of gum or something just to get that, get rid of that number from the total. And, uh, you know, that's whatever. Uh, 666 is the number of beasts. The mark will be required to be taken during the tribulation if you want to buy and sell. However, like I was mentioning earlier about the mark of the beast and the new world order, the church is going to be gone when this happens. Whenever people are required to take the mark, it'll be after the rapture. The church will be poof, will be, will be gone. So as far as I'm concerned, 666 is just a number. It doesn't concern me in the least bit because I'm, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven and I'm not going to be here for the tribulation. I'm not going to have to decide whether or not I'm going to take the mark or not because I ain't going to be here. Tribulation ain't for me. It won't just be that you must have the mark of the beast to buy and sell. As we read here, the relationship between labor and wages will be totally uneven. You'll have to work all. It'd be like even worse than it used to be you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, you'll be working just to feed yourself, just to keep yourself alive. As we'll read further here in the next paragraphs, 
This pictures a financial merry-go-round where all human labor is only sufficient for human existence. At this time, luxuries are gone. Hopes of getting ahead, of retirement, or even future betterment to any degree are gone. It will take all that most people can do to just survive. This is describing a different future than most of us imagine. In this time of severe poverty and economic collapse, there will still be pockets of great wealth. This is pictured by the oil and the wine. Those who are super rich will isolate themselves from this coming poverty. The rich will grow increasingly richer and the poor will become even poorer as the world faces total economic collapse. So all the stuff that we take for granted uh, is going to be gone. You ain't going to be able to do it no more. Going out to eat. I like going out to eat. Going on vacation. That's fun, right? Some people take a whole lot of vacations. <laughs> take vacation every weekend. Uh, getting your nails done, ladies. I know during this pandemic, all the nail salons and stuff were shut down. And y'all were just chomping at the bit. Just couldn't wait to get get your nails done. Get your hair did. Couldn't wait. Now it's finally open. You know, there won't be none of that in tribulation. Won't be none of that in tribulation. You won't have any money for that. All your money's gonna go to food so you can stay alive. And then another point is, you know, as much as liberals like to complain about rich people, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. If you think rich people are rich and greedy now, just wait till the tribulation. Who do you think makes up the new world order? You know, the new world order. Always talking about. I'm not denying it. I'm not, when I, when I said earlier about the conspiracy theories about the new world, I'm not denying that there is a new world order coming. I'm not denying that. It is made up of the world's richest people, like some of the people you probably see on TV, like Bill Gates, stuff like that. Wouldn't surprise me a bit if he was part of the new world order. But what I'm saying is, by the time that comes to be, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be gone. Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And I just noticed something as I was reading that. Look at there, it says, and power was given unto them. So, and this book, we're going to go through it. It's going to go through these four methods that death is going to use. But I just realized it says them. So it's talking about all the horse riders. Not necessarily this one. But anyway, we'll continue on. If I can figure out where we were. Anyway, the fourth seal revealed the fourth horse. A pale horse. The Greek term is literally calorous, meaning pale green. The rider is death, and hell follows, follows him. Physical death destroys the body, and hell destroys the soul. There are four forms of death associated with this seal. The first is the sword. This is not war, it is murder. This is men taking life wantonly and without any cause at all. Murder is the ultimate expression of of selfishness and depravity and it will be rampant when this seal is opened let me go get my mountain dew i forgot it in the kitchen now if you've ever seen the movie tombstone you know this verse of the bible right it's mentioned twice in that movie at the beginning and the scene at the train station, I know if you've seen Tombstone, you love that movie. The scene at the train station now. Anyway, this is death. The first method death will use is the sword. In situations like this, you often hear people say, well, it's like the wild, wild west out here. You know, depending on the, how rough their neighborhood is. In reference to the lawlessness of the western part of America in the last half of the 19th century. We've seen countless movies about it. However, this will be much worse than that. Morality, you know, 
even back then, morality was more prevalent than it is now. But not everybody was going around murdering. But during this time in the tribulation, morality, self-restraint, all that stuff's out the window. Then, then follows hunger and death. When deception rules, wars rage, and the economy collapses, millions will simply starve to death because there is no food available for them. Jesus spoke of these things in Matthew 24. He said there would be earthquakes, famines, and plagues. When civilization begins to collapse, all defenses against such things will evaporate. A terrible time will then follow, marked by hunger and widespread death. The interconnectivity of our world makes widespread plagues and famine literally just a heartbeat away from everyone on earth. And did I write this verse down? No, we'll go there. I got a lot from Matthew 20, 24. 24 7 says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and divers places. So considering what we talked about earlier regarding economic turmoil, this isn't too hard to believe, right? When we were talking about you'd have to work a whole day just to afford a little bit of food to eat, it's not, you know, too far outside the realm of your imagination to figure that there's going to be a lot of people going hungry and starving to death. The way our world is connected today makes spreading disease pretty easy. I think we just witnessed that, you know, and not just human disease either. But agricultural disease, like you might, I was reading that thinking to myself, uh, the interconnectivity of our world makes widespread plagues and famine literally just a heartbeat away. I'm like, well, how do you spread famine through travel? And I was like, well, there's diseases that affect agriculture that if they were able to, a human being, like that's why customs text you for food. <laughs> they don't want you bringing food, fruit and vegetables and stuff in from other countries on the plane. It's because they it might have a disease in it that might spread to our crops over here, and they try to avoid that. But uh, although I think this coronavirus has been greatly exaggerated, uh, it did spread relatively quickly, right? And that was because of air travel and stuff like that, people getting on planes and taking it other places. Then follows death by wild beasts, the predator of the earth, are waiting for the weakness of mankind. We humanize animals and make them our friends, but at this time they will turn on mankind and destroy many. We read here that one-fourth of the earth will perish at this time. There are approximately 6 billion people on earth. If this seal were broken right now, 1.5 billion people would perish. This is a sad testimony to the consequences of the sinful nature of man. Note here that these are forces that are already present on the earth right now. The opening of the seals carries these forces to unprecedented extremes. These scenes of destruction are the inescapable consequences of the presence of sin in our world. Now the animals going to turn on us, man. Fido. Spot. Whatever you got. Animals are going to turn on us. Now, we already know that there's a whole lot of animals out there that could kill us if they wanted to. You ever think about that? Even your dog, really. Uh, you, when you just think about your little dog, depends on what kind of dog you got. But that dog could kill you if you want to. And you see people playing with snakes and tigers and whatnot. You're like, I wonder if that tiger knows he could kill him anytime he wanted to. So we know that. We know animals that can kill us and we try to avoid them. But in this time, they're going to come for us. They're not going to be scared of us anymore. Uh, you know, now you there's a way you see a bear in the woods, you can probably scare that bear off or do whatever to get that bear to go away. And other animals as well, but that's not going to be what they're going to do anymore during the tribulation. Uh, everything death uses, as we just saw there, and the other ones as well, but everything death uses is stuff that is, we already have it. It's already here on earth now. It's not some new thing they're introducing. One way we can look at it, uh, the breaking of the seal, is that God removing his hand of, like, why is this stuff happening? Why is stuff that we already have, and 
Jews in some ways here on earth, why is all of a sudden it getting out of control? Look at it as if when the seal's broken, God taking his protective hand off of the earth and letting these th things just do their thing, letting the sin of the sin of the world really show itself. Uh, the th these things become unrestrained when God takes his hand away. People don't understand the importance of what God is doing on earth right now, even people who don't believe in him, you know. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, o Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. The first four seals dealt with natural or physical forces. Now we move to the spiritual realm. The fifth seal reveals the souls that have been killed because of their faithfulness to the word of God and for the testimony to the truth of the word. These martyrs pray a very different prayer from the one Jesus taught us to pray in this age. Jesus taught us to pray for our enemies. These saints are praying for vengeance. They are asking God to judge and avenge their shed blood on the earth, and he is going to do just that. Once again, we see that the program of God has changed from grace to judgment. This is not a picture of the age of grace when God endures the injustices of men. This is a picture of a future time when God judges the earth and these people are urging him to complete this time of vengeance. They are told to rest for a little season until all the plans of, of God for humanity are fulfilled. Then they will see the completed acts of God both in grace as well as judgment. For Christians in this church age dispensation, we are not to seek vengeance on those that do us wrong. Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. However, during the tribulation, the time of God's grace is over. It's done. And this is the time of judgment. Even today we see people make, mock God's word. They seem to find new ways to sin every day. And God allows it. And it may even frustrate us sometimes, but there is coming a day when their playtime is over. You know, how many times, when I don't know how you grew up as a kid, but you'd be sitting there acting a fool, and your mama would come in, say something, and then come go out, you'd be acting a fool, she'd come in again and say something, you'd keep on, and I'm going to whoop your tail. And you'd just keep on acting a fool, and then she'd come in with the belt or the fly swatter or whatever it was she had, the wooden spoon. Playtime was over. She told you what was going to happen. And uh, now it was time. Now her grace was over. And now it was time for her judgment. So one day that's going to be the, the case for all of humanity when it comes to God. Revelation, we're going to read verses 12 through 17 now. Finish her own up. And I beheld. When he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth... And the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? The sixth seal reveals a time when we call nature when what we call nature loses divine restraint. The forces that govern our natural world are upset so that things no longer happen as we expect. 
the stars fall to earth, the seasons are interrupted, the heaven is rolled back, and the geographical features of the earth are shifted. At this time, men will totally abandon all government of any kind and will move into caves in order to find a place to die. Those who refuse to pray to God will then pray to rocks, asking them to fall on them to end their misery. Note that all humanity knows what is happening. This is not a natural disaster. This is not man-made disaster. This is the wrath of the Lamb of God, and no one will be able to stand in this day of God's judgment. So there are some who look at God as someone who created this earth, and then he stepped back and just let it do its thing. However, God is in full control. Without his restraint, everything would just go haywire. Notice in verse 16 there, During this time, there can be no more denial that God is real. People like to live in a fantasy world of their own creation, but one day, one day it's going to be over. They ask the rocks to kill them. Rather than cry out to God for mercy, how many people are that stubborn these days? You know, they want to mock Christianity or whatnot, say it ain't real, and you'd be like, well, if I could prove to you, Christianity was true would you become a Christian no they don't want to be a Christian they don't want to be under that moral authority of the Lord and notice it ain't no different here rather than try and call out to God God have mercy on me a sinner uh, they beg the rocks to kill them but unfortunately for them death is not going to be an escape death is you can't escape God through death so let's hurry and read a final word. Those who refuse to believe will eventually have such hardened hearts that they cannot believe. Instead of repenting and praying to the Lord for salvation, they pray to the rocks to destroy them. These people are saying openly in public what many lost people feel privately and secretly today. Many lost people are convinced in their own minds that death is somehow an escape into nothingness. Ungodly men think they can escape the terrible consequences of their evil by dying. They believe that in death they escape their problems and that there will be no consequences beyond death. The Bible assures us this is not so. It is appointed and a man wants to die and after this the judgment. Always remember that born again Christians will not be a part of this final scene of trouble. The great promise is found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Let's go there real quick. I think I know what verse we're talking about. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's another one you can tell people when they like, well, the church is going to have to go through tribulation. There is no rapture. God hath not appointed us to wrath. Tribulation is a time of wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. So therefore, why would we be going through it? Anyway, this whole terrible scene was specifically sent to the seven churches of Asia and to us so that we can read it and understand our place in God's program. Christians would do well to study these events of the end time so that we can warn other people. However, we need to remember that this awful time of the tribulation, it ain't for us. It's for them. It ain't for us. That's going to do it for today. We're going to be in 13, the saved and the great tribulation next week in Revelation chapter 7. Let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Let me get the microphone up here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word today, God, even though we couldn't do it like we normally do it. At least we got a chance to get in the word and dig around and find your truths, God, and what your plan is for the future, for the church, and for the rest of the world, God. I pray that something in this study would help someone in their Christian walk, help someone in their studying on their own time, Lord, as well. And we pray for everybody else who is uh, trying to have Sunday school and church services in these difficult times this morning, God. I pray you would touch people and be with them, Lord. Lift them up and encourage them. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll see you all next sunday if we don't have regular if you know if we do this again eventually we're going to go back to the fellowship hall and the people who are watching on youtube y'all just gonna have to do what you do but see y'all next sunday y'all have a blessed week